Muy bien, buenas tardes eh, señores académicos y académicas. Eh, vamos a dar inicio a la sesión del día de la fecha de la Academia Argentina de Cirugía. El primer punto del día de la fecha es la aprobación de la sesión anterior, que fue ya evaluada en la reunión previa. A continuación, eh, nuestro secretario, el doctor Manuel Montesino, va a comentar los asuntos centrados. Doctor Manuel. Antes. Buenas noches. Se recuerda a los miembros de la academia que con motivo de haberse implementado la modalidad online para la realización de las sesiones debido a la pandemia COVID-19, se requiere que registren su asistencia mediante el formulario del link que se copia en el chat en vivo. Se encuentra abierta la inscripción de trabajos para aspirar al premio, Argenti eh, premio Academia Argentina de Cirugía hasta el 30 de junio. Existe especial interés en que los trabajos leídos en esta academia sean enviados para su publicación en la revista Argentina de Cirugía. La presentación deberá ajustarse al reglamento de la revista y todos los trabajos serán enviados a revisión por pares de acuerdo con las políticas de calidad editorial. La presentación de casos clínicos es una de las modalidades que la comisión directiva considera incluir en las próximas sesiones. Para tal fin, se solicita a los miembros de la academia el envío de casos no interactivos, para integrar la sábana de futuras sesiones. Por último, la próxima sesión del eh, miércoles primero de julio, eh, escucharemos la comunicación Reconstrucción Oro Mandibular con Planificación Virtual de Peroné de los autores Rubino, Candelino, Gragut, González Calderón, Omeñuc, Lerner, Santa María. El relator será el doctor Osvaldo González Aguilar. ¿Listo? Muchas gracias, doctor Montesinos. Eh, a continuación, el próximo punto, tenemos esta noche el eh, honor y el privilegio de tener como conferencista al doctor Echenejal Patel del Hospital <coughs> del Memorial Sloan Kettering de Nueva York. Doctor Patel, que va a ser presentado por el doctor Figari, eh, nos va a brindar su conferencia sobre los avances en la definición intraoperatoria de márgenes oncológicamente suficientes en tumores mucosos. Doctor Figari, por favor. Gracias, doctor Saco. Es, es un placer estar esta noche presentando a, a un colega y gran amigo, que es el doctor Esnejal Patel. El doctor Patel, como todos ustedes saben, es muy conocido por la comunidad argentina y latinoamericana de cirujanos de cabeza y cuello. Es eh, cirujano de cabeza y cuello en el servicio eh, de esa especialidad, del Memorial Sloan Kettering eh, Cancer Center de Nueva York y es también profesor en el Servicio de Otorrino de Lingología eh, de la Universidad de Cornell. Eh, él ha accedido a brindarnos esta conferencia sobre un tema que realmente le apasiona y que domina mucho, y que creemos también que va a ser no solamente de utilidad para eh, los cirujanos de cabeza y cuello, sino para todos los cirujanos interesados en la oncología de los tumores mucosos. La conferencia que va a brindar el doctor Patel va a ser en inglés, eh, y a posteriori el doctor Manuel Montesinos, el doctor Terrés y yo le transferiremos a él las preguntas que puedan venir del auditorio. Snehal, please, thank you very much for being here. Uh, we are really very honored for your presence. And uh, if you are ready, you can start sharing your, your screen and, uh, and delivering the wonderful presentation you prepared. Perfect. Thank you very much, Marcelo, for the introduction. Although I couldn't understand a word of it. I'm assuming it was all good, um, but thank you. And uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege, uh, Dr. Sacco, Dr. Mantasino, Dr. Terrace, and the officers of the society. Uh, thank you for inviting me and having me here today. So uh, Marcelo asked me to talk on some of the work that we've been doing here at Memorial Hospital on intraoperative definition of surgical margins, primarily in head neck tumors, but also in other parts of the body. And I, I would like to, you know, use the next 30, 40 minutes to show you some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, by way of disclosures, uh, can you see my screen? I don't see the screen moving. We see the screen fixing the first slide. Yes. Yeah, but I, I, the slide doesn't move. Uh, can I stop the share for just a second and yes, I'll yes, do it again? No problem.
Let me share it again and see if that helps. Yes. No, it won't uh, advance. Can you can you see any slide at all? No, only the only the first one, the presentation. Yeah, sorry, I don't know why it's not uh, advancing. Okay, now. Do you see it advancing? Now you are not sharing. You stop sharing. How about now? Now, now we are seeing, yes, yeah, it, it is the second it's slide. Yeah. No, no, okay, no, it, yeah, okay. All right, sorry about that. Uh, no. You know, when you do a talk on technology, this is what happens. Uh, simple stuff doesn't work uh, as you want it to, but uh, uh, I just wanted to, you know, do my usual disclosures. I have several patents uh, on uh, in vivo imaging technology and uh, laser surgical technology. Uh, two of these that are listed here, uh, I have equity interest in small companies that have been spun out from Memorial Hospital. And there are several others where uh, I have, I'm a co-inventor, but we do not have any equity interest in it. Uh, uh, so th those were my disclosures. Now, when you talk about surgery, all of us surgeons, we know that uh, surgery is the primary treatment for most solid cancers, in spite of all the advances that have been made in non-surgical options, most solid cancers are still treated most effectively with surgery today. And the traditional principles of surgical oncology uh, revolve around removing the tumor with wide margins of normal tissue. Uh, and this is basically because of the impact of margins on outcomes, both local recurrence and survival are linked to significantly worse outcomes if after adequate operation, the patient ends up getting a positive surgical margin. And that really is, has been the basis of traditional surgical oncology, dating back to the days of John Hunter and all the rest, uh, up to Hayes Martin, who was the father of uh, modern head neck surgery here at Memorial Hospital. So, Basically, uh, especially in the head and neck, when you do a more extensive operation, uh, you're going to impact the patient's quality of life, breathing, swallowing, voice, airway protection. And it may not be as evident in other parts of the body, but it still affects the patient's quality of life, the more tissue you remove. And which is why uh, less radical approaches came into, into use along with the use of adjuvant post-operative treatment. Specifically for the head and neck, uh, these treatment paradigms cause a lot of post-treatment side effects. Uh, thankfully, we don't see you know, the usual uh, or the typical anti-gump deformity nowadays, but still patients suffer from a lot of issues on their quality of life on various functions. And that is why as surgical oncologists, our constant struggle is to balance survival versus quality of life in terms of achieving adequate margins and complete resection of the tumor. So before I go into the, the things that we're doing to change the paradigm of how we treat head and neck cancers, I'm gonna take a little bit of a detour and uh, talk about some philosophy. Uh, on a basic sense, what does margin status mean? So, you know, it's like beauty, it's a matter of perception. It depends on who you ask. Uh, for the surgeon, uh, it means uh, you want to do more, maybe resect wider because uh, I couldn't figure out where the tumor ends and where normal tissue begins. Uh, for the pathologist, they are interested in finding very subtle disease or microscopic disease that can change the patient's management. And for the other members of the team, the radiation medical oncologists, it's an opportunity to add treatment in the hopes of improving outcome. But the most important person in the equation is the patient and their family. And for them, it's the anxiety and fear of tumor being left behind uh, or recurring if there is a positive margin. When you think about uh, how 
people process uh, a report of a positive or closed margin, uh, one tends to ignore the many, many assumptions that we make in interpreting microscopic margins as we analyze them today. So I won't go into the whole list of technical issues, you know, the processing, histopathologic uh, uh, mismanagement and all of that, but I will focus on two or three important things, which is what led me to uh, develop technology to change the paradigm for ex vivo assessment of margins. And the first assumption that we are making is that if you have a positive or a closed margin, uh, that represents incomplete excision of the tumor. In other words, if you have a positive margin, there automatically has to be residual tumor in the surgical bed. And therefore, you escalate treatment, do more surgery or add radiation or whatever else. And the question that you want to ask is, how do you know if there is microscopic residual tumor in the surgical bed? Because current technology for most tumors uh, is incapable of imaging uh, or you know, uh, your fingers are not sensitive enough to uh, palpate residual microscopic disease in a surgical bed. For some tumors, there are serum markers and molecular tests that might be helpful. But for most head and neck tumors, except for perhaps thyroid, there's no serum marker that you can use to be sure that there's no uh, cancer that's left behind inside the patient. Uh, so basically, there is no technology that we currently have as surgeons that is capable of in vivo detection of residual microscopic tumor. So then that raises the possibility that if you have a positive or a closed margin, that may not always represent residual tumor in the surgical bed. And there is data uh, from, for instance, sarcoma resections. After unplanned uh, excision of a lump, uh, the specimen of re-resection doesn't always have residual tumor. Same thing with breast cancer. Breast lumpectomy specimens with positive or closed margins, they don't always have residual tumor in the re-excision specimen. And specifically within the head and neck, this is data from uh, Göttingen in Germany, where transoral laser endoscopic resection of laryngopharyngeal tumors, some oral cavity tumors, uh, had no residual tumor in the majority of re-resection specimens. And as you would expect, if there was no residual tumor, the patient does better as compared to patients who have residual tumor in their re-resection specimens. So really it is this group of patients that you want to figure out and add more aggressive treatment instead of everybody who has a positive or a closed margin. But unfortunately, right now, there is no way of, of doing that. We don't have that technology. The other assumption that we are making is that cancer uh, arises in just one focus, one single location, independent of the surrounding tissue. Now, in most head and neck mucosal cancers that are tobacco and alcohol derived, there is this thing called a baseline field defect. And that's true for many other disease systems, esophagus, cervix, uh, are two good examples. Uh, and a negative margin does not guarantee local control because you can have a tumor develop from the edge of your resection in a field defect. And basically, uh, the margin status in that situation has no real meaning in terms of the patient's eventual outcome. The third thing that we face as surgeons is you mark a, tum uh, a line around. Uh, the tumor, you excise it, and when the specimen comes out, your margin's way smaller than what you had drawn on the patient. And that's a well-known phenomenon in many parts of the body, including the head and neck, where you have shrinkage of uh, normal tissue around the, the tumor, and there are other artifactual changes that come with processing the tissue, so that ex vivo assessment of margins using conventional histopathology which happens after surgical resection, has many, many inherent limitations. So then the question becomes, what can we do to improve this traditional paradigm of how we assess surgical margins? And there are many efforts underway to do macroscopic uh, assessment or guide the surgeon for mapping margins ahead of time uh, for instance, in the head and neck, uh, people have used intraoperative ultrasound. 
um, dual energy CT, and where these can give you a gross estimate of the tumor, none of these tests can image actual tumor cells microscopically. So that's what we are trying to change. And things like frozen section uh, are not very helpful because of sampling error. Uh, that we don't use them very commonly, at least I don't in my practice in, uh, in the head and neck because they have very limited value and it ad adds cost and time uh, to the operation. So basically, uh, my research over the last uh, 12 or so years has focused on developing technology for in vivo imaging of cancer and precancer with two main uh, directions. One is uh, early detection for screening, which I won't talk about today. And the other obvious uh, application is to change this existing traditional paradigm of ex vivo assessment of margins to real time in vivo intraoperative assessment of the margins. So instead of taking out the specimen and then sending it to the lab, how about assessing margins inside the patient even before you make your incision and through the process of surgery? And that's some of the, the, the techniques and the technology that I will share with you uh, in the rest of the talk. Uh, somehow it's stuck again. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, try it again. Sorry about that. No problems, Nihal. It's just, uh, it, it may be the internet bandwidth, I don't know. Maybe. Let me just try again. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, yes. so we're back on track. Okay, yeah. so, so essentially what we do as surgeons all day in the operating room is you're trying to differentiate tumor versus normal and place your incision uh, between those two entities uh, so that you balance, uh, you know, local control or survival against function. And there's a lot of work in this field of uh, optical imaging. Uh, I've made a list here. I obviously won't talk about all of them, but uh, I'll focus on two technologies that we've developed at uh, Memorial Hospital uh, for, uh, for assessing uh, tumor, cancer, and precancer in vivo inside patients. Uh, the first, uh, the first technology is based on a targeted molecule, a PARP inhibitor, that we've uh, developed in collaboration with Thomas Reiner, who is a chemist at the uh, at our hospital and has uh, weaponized. PARP inhibitors uh, added a fluorescent molecule in there for imaging. Now, just a very quick uh, background uh, for those of you who can remember from med school, uh, the PARP family of enzymes are very important in repairing single-strand DNA breaks. So they are very quickly recruited to sites of DNA damage within the cell. And PARP1 overexpression occurs pretty much universally in all tumors. Uh, because of this reason. And over the past six or seven years, there are quite a few PARP1 inhibitors that have been approved by the FDA for use in many disease systems. And you guys are familiar with uh, a lot of this work, uh, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, pancreatic, lung cancer. So these are well-known uh, drugs that are already in, in clinical use. And that's an attractive thing for us because uh, it, it, it hastens the process of getting approval for using any imaging agent in actual patients. And the, the, the application that we are using is, uh, is not specific to any tumor because the sensitivity of these in many tumor systems to PARP inhibition is very variable but we are not looking to cure these cancers uh, by PARP inhibition. What we are looking at is uh, to use the PARP1 molecule for imaging those tumors. 
And that's the attraction in terms of uh, using a molecule that's widely applicable to many tumor systems because of its wide expression at the very basic level of tumorogenesis. The trouble is that PARP1 is a nuclear target. So it resides within the nucleus and it's very, very difficult to design probes that will cr cross the nuclear membrane and allow a fluorescent or a radiologic agent uh, to cross that barrier. But with some very clever chemistry, Thomas Reiner and his group have synthesized two agents. One is a fluorescent agent, this PARP IFL, FL is fluorescence, uh, and there's an 18F PARP IFL, which is a, uh, a PET agent. I won't talk about the PET agent, but uh, we'll focus on the intraoperative fluorescence use of this uh, molecule. And basically, uh, I apologize, I don't know why we're... It must be the VPN connection with the memorial, but don't worry, it's Yeah, okay. I, I, I don't know. Let, let me... Um, Let me try it again. You see your screen? Yeah, but I, it won't move. So, oh, now it moved. Yeah. Okay. So, so again, apologies. Uh, I, I guess the way it's going, I'll have to apologize a few more times. Um, but uh, th this is basically some very preliminary mouse experiments. This is a dorsal chamber on the mouse's flank. There's a tumor in here and, uh, and a contact uh, plate here on which you place a microscope, a confocal microscope. And the PARP IFL, the fluorescent agent, is injected intravenously into the tail vein of the mouse. And we are imaging the tumor in vivo in real time. And if you keep an eye on the counter here, you see immediately within a few seconds, there is a green blush of the dye that extravasates into the extracellular, uh, the tumor matrix. And then over time, the, the PARP IFL agent accumulates in the nuclei and stays there for uh, quite a length of time. Uh, so those were the initial experiments uh, that we did. And then we confirmed that PARP1 is overexpressed in human oral squamous cell carcinoma. Here you see this HNE of tumor versus normal and very clear delineation, nice expression of PARP1 uh, in tumor, but not in normal. So these were the initial experiments uh, that led us to even explore the concept. And the next question to ask was, is there a differential between tumor and benign and a gradation between the two with mild, moderate, and severe dysplasia and this is work that was done in collaboration with uh, Moni Kuriakos, who's a head neck surgeon in India. And when we analyze specimens that are benign versus mild, moderate, severe dysplasia, you see the expression is low compared to significantly higher expression in patients with uh, invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, and that led us to explore the concept of uh, using this agent topically. So what if we were able to apply the agent in the oral cavity and see if it uh, accumulates within a uh, tumor? And this is an orthotopic mouse model. And just to show you that we did a lot of uh, toxicity studies in the small animal and followed it up with large animal studies, proved the concept, and based on that, we were able to get IND approval from the FDA for clinical use. And the attraction here is that this agent is very, very low cost. And uh, the estimate is it'll be about 25 cents per dose of reagent. And the other attractive uh, part is that you can mass manufacture it and it's stable at extremes of temperature. So if you had to use it in, in villages in the field, uh, for screening purposes, it's a great uh, quality that it doesn't need refrigeration uh, or any special reconstitution. 
based on this kind of uh, toxicity data, we were able to bring this agent into clinical use. Uh, so over the past four years or so, we've been exploring the use of this agent in human patients with oral cancer. And uh, the concept is that you have the patient gargle the solution uh, of PARP-IFL, uh, leave it in the mouth for a couple of minutes, maximum of five minutes, and then have them spit it out and gargle a clearing solution. And then you image the oral cavity with an infrared laser. And here's an example of a patient uh, in early on in the study with a very, very small dose. It's only 100 nanomoles, very minuscule dose of PARP-IFL uh, to image this tumor on the left lateral border of the tongue. And you see this, you can already see a, even at low doses, there's a signal around on the tumor and you can see the edge of the tumor pretty well. And if you do that with higher doses, this is the next step up. There's an even more clearer delineation just with two or three minutes of topical application uh, of the agent. Uh, and indeed, we were pleasantly surprised to learn that you can differentiate benign versus tumor. So this patient had, an, had a cancer that was excised elsewhere and came to me with a, with a scar with what looked like tumor in the front end of the scar and there was granulation tissue that looked benign in the posterior aspect of the scar. And indeed, when you look at the, the PARP imaging, uh, the front portion, which was tumor, uh, was fluorescent while the, the benign portion wasn't. So we have anecdotal evidence like this, which is very encouraging in terms of being able to separate benign versus malignant in vivo. And uh, this is just an example to show you that uh, the oral cavity or the head neck is not just, it's not a unique site in terms of PARP expression. Uh, there are many, many other sites uh, listed here where you have a high expression of PARP1 uh, within the tumor compared to normal. And within the upper aerodigestive tract, I showed you some uh, data on oral cancer, but we have also studied uh, cancer of the oropharynx and the esophagus for uh, PARP1 expression and uh, use of the PARP-IFL agent. And here's an example of ex vivo human specimens of esophageal cancer. As you saw in uh, oral cancer, there's a big differential between PARP1 expression uh, in tumor versus normal epithelium and uh, dysplasia. And the concept that we are trying to explore for esophageal cancer, and this is in collaboration with one of my colleagues in the thoracic surgery service, uh, Daniela Molina, uh, is that can we use this kind of uh, technology for two separate issues? One is an ex vivo assessment of an esophageal biopsy for rapid throughput uh, evaluation of cancer versus uh, normal. And the other more attractive uh, possibility is using uh, this technology for in vivo uh, imaging through a flexible endoscope. And I will talk to you a little bit about uh, that uh, at the end of the talk. One other interesting concept that we are trying to explore is uh, to try and image Barrett's esophagus, where you have a field change in a segment of the esophagus, and you're trying to figure out where to do a biopsy to detect early cancer. And that's not easy using uh, current technology because uh, there's, there's no agent that will stick to the esophagus. And we've collaborated with, uh, with a company which makes a balloon with Luprizol stripes on it. And we can load those stripes with the agent, inflate the balloon, let the agent stick for three to four minutes, and you can see that after three minutes of topical application, the, the PARP IFL agent penetrates up to a depth of about a millimeter, a millimeter and a half to you know, image uh, into the depth of the mucosa. So it's a pretty exciting concept. This is topical application uh, of, of the agent. Now, the trouble is if you, if you were to use topical uh, agents for guiding tumor resection, you are restricted to analyzing just the surface of the mucosa. You have no idea what the depth of the, of the tumor is. 
And that's the next step forward with uh, doing an intravenous injection of, uh, of the agent. Uh, the reason it has lagged behind is this requires a lot of money. So the topical agent uh, went through the FDA very quickly because uh, it was micromolar doses. For an agent to be injected IV, it requires a very, very significant amount of investment. And that's the next step, which we're hoping to accomplish over the next year or so. So this is uh, swine experiments, pig experiments, uh, to show you that uh, we are thinking of the concept of uh, using this kind of technology to assess margins. So here's the, uh, a tumor in a tongue which, and again, this, this is actually mice experiments where you have tumors in the, in the tongue of the mouse. And uh, there's four or five different uh, steps uh, or extent of surgery. Here, you, you have a complete resection. We left behind some tumors, uh, you know, a millimeter amount of tumors progressively, and then image them with intravenous uh, um, PARP injection. And you can see that, you know, e even with very small amount of tumors, uh, you're able to detect minuscule amount of tumors with, uh, with the PARP IFL injected intravenously. So this is the sort of data that we hope to bring to the FDA uh, as the next step to try and, um, you know, prove this concept that the agent can be used for margin mapping inside humans. Now, whether this will be oncologically safe and functionally better. We'll need a lot of research and clinical trials, but this is the concept upon which the fluorescent agent uh, is moving forward in clinical trials, at least uh, at this time. Now, the next technology that I'm gonna talk about is called reflectance confocal microscopy. And this was developed in uh, conjunction with an engineer who is, uh, employed by the Department of Dermatology at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And I think again, I'm stuck. Oops. All right, sorry. I don't know if you can no see, but it's asking no me to restart the program. We have time, no problem. Uh, no, I apologize. That's okay. Uh... So now I'll, I'll try and speed it up, Marcelo, because... Uh, no problem. Okay, so basically, you know, instead of going into the details of how this works, but I will now, simplify... Yeah, now we are not sharing the screen, eh? Oh, all right, sorry. Yes. How, how about now? Yes, but it's not a presentation mode. Did it come on? Yes. Okay. So, so instead of going into details, what I will do is just simplify it and tell you that uh, the technology uses a laser. So again, the theme of my research is light. So we're using laser to image uh, tissue. It's like using uh, an ultrasound with the laser instead of sound waves. So basically what you're doing is scanning the surface of the tissue um, with, a, with a point source of light, with a laser, and then you collect the incident light that comes off the, uh, off the tissue, and then you assemble it uh, in stacks in the computer, and then the software processes it, puts it together, and you have an image uh, that you can see uh, the tissue on fuss. And I'll show you actual examples uh, of what it looks like. Now, this technology has been used for many years in the dermatology field, uh, but the machines look like this. When I first started out, this is 2009, 11 years ago. You can't put this in a person's mouth, obviously. So, you know, we had a long ways to go and a lot of research and a lot of money uh, grants before we were able to, you know, bring this concept into fruition. 
an endoscope that looks like a toothbrush so that you can you know hand hold the the instrument uh like this and then you you're able to kind of uh you know image mucosa in vivo inside a person's mouth and it took uh, a, a lot of work and a lot of years and a lot of money so finally we started the trial in 2000 16 actually the approval came in 15 but 2016 and the way the trial was designed is the patients under anesthesia in the operating room and we image the the tissue in vivo while the patient is asleep and then we record the confocal microscopy videos and we take biopsies from the tissue and then the intent is to compare the HNE versus the confocal images and here's what it looks like. So here I am holding the probe on the patient's tongue. And you'll see in a second that uh, this probe is connected to a laptop computer, which is hooked up to the you know, screens in the, in the OR. And you can see the, the image in real time uh, as, you, as you move the probe over the tissue. And what it really looks like is this. So I'll just use this patient as an example. This woman came to me with uh, an excision of her tumor on the right lateral border of her tongue. So by the time I saw her, there was nothing much to see, uh, the usual scar post excision. And uh, when you feel around, this is the dotted line is where I thought uh, there might be tumor. So I marked it here, and this is your usual centimeter or centimeter and a half margin of excision around what you think the tumor is. Uh, and the intent of the, of the trial is to image a spot within the tumor and also image an area of normal, uh, close to the margin where you think there is normal tissue, take biopsies from both and then compare normal versus tumor. So when you're actually imaging this normal area, here's what it looks like. You can see very nice polygonal cells, very nicely delineated nuclei, bright dots, the cells are very nicely arranged. The blood vessels are perpendicular to the surface and they are orderly. Uh, and if you compare it to tumor around here, you immediately see there's a lot of refraction. This hyperkeratinized uh, tissue is reflective. And here you can see a keratin pearl actually. So this is a keratin pearl, which is a hallmark of squamous cell carcinoma. And you can actually image those kind of things in vivo in real time inside the patient. So if you talk about normal versus tumor, it's very easy to differentiate you know, the two uh, under the microscope in real time as you're doing the operation. And the phase one part of the trial was basically used to try and figure out what the features of squamous cell carcinoma are with confocal microscopy. Uh, things like you know, disorganized epithelium, hyperkeratinization, the uh, size and the arrangement of blood vessels and obviously keratin pearls as I just showed you. And based on this initial phase, we've actually just now completed uh, phase two. We got delayed a little bit by the COVID uh, you know, pandemic. But uh, right now, uh, we've just completed the phase two, which is 60 patients which are blinded and the pathologist is comparing histopathology to the RCM or the uh, reflectance confocal microscopy images to see how accurate uh, they are. So that's the two in vivo imaging technologies that we've developed. Now, to transport these into the patient and specifically into areas where you would benefit from doing minimally invasive surgery, uh, we, uh, I have an interest in transoral resection of larynx and pharynx cancers. Uh, and the technology there is pretty well developed as it is for many other parts of the body uh, using lasers and, and uh, surgical robots. But the trouble with the existing technology, at least in the head and neck, is that when you're working in a narrow space, uh, you can't use the three or four arm robots that people can comfortably use in the abdomen or the thoracic cavity. So unfortunately, uh, the technology for head and neck uh, surgery has kind of lagged behind. So even with the single port system, uh, with the intuitive uh, single port system, that's still not ideal 
for use within the head and neck, especially in the larynx and pharynx. Uh, and having said that, if you use the technology well in properly selected patients, you can achieve very nice functional and oncologic outcomes. The trouble is that the, the cutting instrument that we use, the electrocautery that most surgeons use uh, causes a lot of tissue damage. And when you're trying to use it in a, in a endoscopic, minimally invasive fashion, where you don't have the conventional traction, counter traction of open surgery, you cause a lot of charring. So for my purpose, at least within the head and neck, uh, I'm very interested in using the carbon dioxide laser in preference to other cutting tools such as electrocautery. But the real reason I'm very excited about using lasers is the work that I just showed you. I'm using light to image cancer cells. So how about using the same light for cutting, which means that I can seamlessly integrate in vivo imaging with surgery. And that's something that uh, we set out to do, uh, again, in collaboration with this group of engineers in the research engineering laboratory at Memorial Sloan Kettering about 10 years ago. And the concept is this. Uh, we've developed a small device that has micromotors and lenses and prisms uh, that can respond to manipulation from the operator that's outside the patient. And you bring a laser into the, into the device. And basically what you do is the device sits at the tip of your endoscope. It could be a rigid endoscope for laryngophangeal use. It could be a flexible endoscope for other applications, esophagus, stomach, colon, uh, depending on the application, you can fit a device at the tip of your endoscope so that when you are doing the surgery, you have flexible instruments that go into your field and you manipulate tissue with those flexible instruments, but your cutting instrument is a laser, a carbon dioxide laser that moves in response to your, your scalpel, a, a graphics tablet with a pen that you can draw on the outside and basically it, it moves the laser to follow your uh, movements on the screen outside the patient. And basically that would restore the traction counter traction in tight spaces and allow you to do surgery as you would do an open operation. But more importantly, it would also allow you to use in vivo imaging uh, to map the tumor even before you place your incision and uh, inform your surgery as it goes along. So for example, uh, you can use PARP IFL imaging to delineate the tumor. And I've just put this black line, dotted line around there as an example of what I think should be an adequate resection. And basically use the confocal microscope, as I said, to test it out and say that, okay, this looks clean to me and we will use this as the margin. After you're done, you can examine the post-surgical bed with the PARP IFL laser. Uh, and if there is no fluorescence in the bed, that is a good indication. You can also use the PARP IFL fluorescence imaging on the specimen in the operating room. So as soon as you have the specimen out, you put it on the, on, uh, in the uh, shine the laser on it. If there is no fluorescence on the surface of the, uh, of the specimen. It means that you're away from the, from the tumor. You can slice the specimen and examine the, the slices for fluorescence. And if all of that is clean, you, you have a clean margin, that's a good thing. On the other hand, if there's some residual fluorescence in the surgical bed, you can go after it, excise it if you think that's gonna help. Uh, or you can examine the specimen. If it's the margins closed, you can act appropriately. But either way, you know in real time before the specimen goes out of the operating room whether your operation was adequate or not. So I'm hoping that uh, I've shown you that uh, this is not science fiction. We are actually doing it. Cellular level in vivo imaging is completely feasible. And if we can combine it with flexible robotic technology, uh, we will improve outcomes by not doing too much of a resection so that you can balance local control versus uh, 
uh, uh, functional outcomes in critical areas such as the larynx or pharynx. And this technology is also transportable to other areas of the body. Like I showed you, we're exploring the esophagus. We've not yet uh, done any colon or gastric uh, work yet, but that's next in the pipeline. Uh, eventually, whether we change the paradigm uh, or not, will obviously depend on outcomes and how much value of care we can bring into all of this. So we have a long ways to go, but uh, I just thought I'd share with you the initial work that we've done over the years. And you know, I have to acknowledge a lot of folks here, uh, my fellows uh, who've worked with me over the years, uh, uh, developing and doing all the hard work. Uh, the Department of Radiology, Thomas Reiner, I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> Hilda Stambuck, uh, who uh, has helped with the imaging work, Michelle Bradbury, Dermatology, there's a whole group of people. Milan is the engineer that I talked about and several other folks uh, who uh, have helped with all of these projects. So I'll stop there and uh, hopefully we'll have some questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Patel, uh, for your wonderful conference. Uh, I'm sure it will be uh, some questions. So I will ask uh, Dr. Montesino and Dr. Figari if they have a question to do to, to Dr. <clears throat> Patel. Yes, by now we have two questions from the auditory. I, I let you, Manuel, start first. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Patel, for your excellent lecture. We appreciate that. And uh, one question from Dr. Vanelli. The question is what happens when the tumor is close to the bone? You can use it these techniques only for soft tissue or it use this technique for um, bone margins? Yeah, that, is that Angel asking? Okay, yeah, well, I can't see him. I can't, uh, but tell him I said hello. Um, <clears throat> basically, um, we haven't tried it for bone imaging. We've tried the confocal part for bone imaging and it works but uh, we have not been able to test the power by fluorescent imaging part for bone imaging, but that will be a good uh, you know, collaboration with our sarcoma people. So uh, it, it's interesting how uh, people ask these questions when I present at our grand rounds. So we have general surgical oncology grand rounds every year, and I've presented maybe every year for the past few years. And this was the exact question that came from the sarcoma group, the orthopedic group. Can we use this for bone tumor imaging? And the answer is, I don't know. But I don't see any reason why we should not be able to image it. Uh, the, the, the limitation is time, money, and uh, effort. So uh, it, it'll happen in the future uh, once we have the technology set and if it works. So yes, the answer is yes, it can be done. Thank you, Snehal. I have another question regarding the PARP-1 technique from Dr. Carla Aguabat from Hospital Italiano in Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, probably you have already answered uh, along your presentation because if you see your first uh, experience commenting the use of the PARP-1 with fluorescein, uh, it uh, seems to be that you have a very good control of the peripheric uh, limitations of the tumor regarding the soft tissue, and yeah. there is a limitation to interpret the deep of the tumor. Yes, yeah. Uh, for that, you need uh, the, to complement that with the confocal microscope, or there is a way to use the part one fluorescein technique also for the deep of the tumor. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, that's a great question because with any optical technology, uh, there is a limitation of depth because if you, if you raise the intensity of the light uh, to try and penetrate tissue, you will destroy tissue. That's how lasers work, right? So if, if the light is so intense that it can go deep into the tissue, it will destroy the tissue. You won't get information back from it. Of course. So that, that's an inherent limitation of all optical technology. Uh, the way we are trying to circumvent it or you know try to uh, kind of go around that limitation is by intravenous injection of PARP-IFL. 
So basically, if, if you were able to deliver the tumor, I mean the fluorescent agent to the entire tumor, not just the surface. Okay. Then, uh, as I showed in the last few slides, you can you can resect the tumor. Yeah. And in a sense, if you see fluorescence, you're too close, mm -hmm. right? So your resection should be devoid of any fluorescent activity uh, as you're operating. It's, it's like saying that, okay, if, if we do a lumpectomy in the breast and I've injected blue dye in it, if I see blue, I'm too close to the tumor. Uh, that's the principle. Yes. Okay. Manuel? Uh, when, one of the question is uh, connected with the, the, um, the pathologist. Mm -hmm. uh, you, 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 when you use this procedure, you also use a, pro a pathologist for frozen section of the margins? Yeah, I mean, personally, I do not use frozen sections because I don't think they are reliable. But, you know, the, this technology is not meant to replace the pathologist. In fact, when, when, when I first started, I could not recruit a pathologist because they thought I'm trying to, you know, take mm -hmm. their jobs. Uh, but, you know, and also with the pathologist, they are used to seeing color you know, images, H and E, not black and white on fast images. So I, I didn't have time to show you guys, but we we had to devise a Photoshop program where one of the people in the lab wrote an algorithm to quantify the light that's reflected and convert it into pink and purple. So basically, we, we wrote an algorithm to automatically convert the black and white image to a color image to show the pathologists and get their interest. So once we got them interested, then they got hooked onto it. And now, now, now they're on board and, and they know that we are not trying to replace them. So the way I think it will work is, this is, it's an interoperative guide for the surgeon. And because uh, the technology is electronic, uh, the pathologist can view it at the same time as the surgeon is viewing it. And it's a consensus, uh, consensus thing. Now, if, if both pathologist and surgeon agree that list looks clean, you go ahead and if it doesn't, then you act on it. So the intent is not to replace the pathologist. Okay, thank you. I agree. There are uh, several interesting questions regarding the part one technique. And one is regarding the, the, the approximately number of false positives that you can have so that the, the part one is positive in a benign lesion. And if you nowadays are using the technology uh, on a daily basis in order to guide your biopsies. No, I, the, I'll take the second question first. No, this is a clinical trial. So this is not in regular use. Uh, in fact, we are not even using it to map margins right now. Okay. So all the work that I showed on margins is experimental. It's in the mouse model, uh, unpublished. Actually, it'll be published uh, tomorrow, I think. It's in mm -hmm. Nature Scientific Reports. It'll be published tomorrow, or it may have been published today. So it's, it's completely hot off the press. You guys are the first ones uh, seeing this uh, data. <laughs> so it, it, it's not, not in clinical practice. The hope is that you know, if we are able to prove it and the FDA ag agrees, then we will bring it to uh, clinical use. And I, you know, judging by my experience so far, I don't see any reason why we should not be able to do that. Uh, the other question, uh, <clears throat> I forget, uh, Marcelo. The number, of, the number of false positives. Uh... Yeah, so, you know, the, when, when I first started, uh, you know, collaborating with these guys, that was my first question. I'm like, what about inflammation? Uh, because my interest is the oral cavity and upper aerodigestive tract. So in, specifically in the oral cavity, if you have periodontitis or some infection or inflammation, um, and you go to the villages in India, everybody has bad teeth. Uh, you can't use this for screening if it is non-specific and if an inflammatory lesion also lights up under par, uh, under the imaging. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised that um, it's very specific. So again, I didn't have time to show uh, data on the PET 
project. Mm -hmm. So we have a molecule that's loaded with uh, 18F uh, to image uh, the PARP agent a as a PET probe to do a PET scan. Okay. And when you compare it to the FDG PET, there's a big difference. So all the inflammatory reactive stuff lights up on FDG PET and not on uh, PARP IX uh, PET. So it, it's pretty specific and I'm, I, I sound like I'm a salesman of uh, you know snake oil, but uh, I was surprised. I'm sure there are false positives and we'll learn with accumulating experience, we'll find out that uh, there are uh, plenty of limitations, but so far I haven't seen many of those. Thank you. Manuel? Yes, another question is, with this a safe margin uh, for you, how many millimeters are safe for you? Okay, so that, that's another piece of data that I didn't have time to show. It's a huge controversy, right? Uh, especially in the head and neck, the conventional number is five millimeters, okay? Now, if you look back at how that five millimeter number came about, uh, there is no data I mean, it happened here at Memorial Hospital. So in the 1970s, uh, I won't name the surgeons because they are my bosses, but they decided that five millimeters is the cutoff, <laughs> okay? And, and when you look at the numbers, uh, we, we published uh, just maybe two years ago, if you do a scientific analysis of the data, the number's more like two millimeters or something like that. And I, I tell my fellows that there is no magic number. So it's not like two millimeters is good and 2.2 is not. Because there's many inherent lim limitations in how we assess margins and process the specimen, tissue shrinkage, you know, all the things that yeah. we all know about. And my question uh, is that if there was some technology that shows you that you've removed the tumor completely, why would a one cell margin not be enough? Okay, so we, yeah. we argue about two millimeters and five millimeters because there is no way of detecting tumor inside the patient. But if there was a foolproof way of seeing cancer inside patients, you give me a good argument why you would do a two millimeter margin or a five millimeter margin. It makes no sense. Right? right, so that, that's the limitation. But basically for me right now, I, I, I do conventional surgery. So I will draw a centimeter or a centimeter and a half depending on the size of the tumor and uh, the anticipated risk of that patient needing post-op adjuvant treatment. So you want to balance risk versus benefit and that's what I do in clinical practice. I don't use any of these tools right now to change margins. These are all experimental. Another question from Dr. Bocalate, also from Buenos Aires, is uh, regarding if you are trying or testing another molecules as alternative to PAR1 that could be even more specific. Mm -hmm. that, that's a good question. I mean, we, we are not the only group doing this, okay? So there's, I mean, I don't know, you know, even, uh, even Rosenthal. Yes from UCSF, he, he has weaponized uh, EGFR inhibitors, cetuximab. Uh, there's, there's many other groups who've, you know, similarly kind of uh, uh, weaponized other targeted molecules. The reason I'm very excited about PARP is it's non-specific because it's a nuclear agent and wherever you have DNA damage, uh, you're gonna have that accumulate. So it's not specific to a, a surface receptor. It's not, you know, targeted to any in-between midstream uh, event. It's basically a nuclear target. Uh, and uh, you can argue that it's non-specific in that sense. So for treatment, it may not be great, but for a surgeon to be able to see cancer versus not, it's a great tool. Manuel? Uh, another question comes about uh, if you have experience with the use of ultrasound, uh, intraoperative ultrasound for the definition of the surgical margins. Yeah, that, that's also a good question. I mean, we in the United States, we don't use, uh, at least in the head neck world, we don't use ultrasound that much. 
the hepatobiliary surgeons, you know, live off ultrasound. The general surgeons, general surgical oncologists have an ultrasound machine in their room. So over the years, I've used ultrasound, uh, you know, with the finger probe. I don't know if you guys have that. Yeah. Uh, there's a probe that you can load on the finger uh, and to judge the depth of tongue cancers, for instance. And right now, um, I'm running a kind of ad hoc trial to see if, uh, you know, my fellows and me are accurate enough in just measuring by palpation. Because what happened, uh, I don't know how much you're aware, but the eighth edition of the AJCC UICC staging system for head neck cancers, for oral cancers, uh, and I was part of the group that you know changed the the definition of the system. Uh, includes depth of invasion now as uh, a determinant of the, the T category. And the trouble is that you don't have any good means of assessing the depth accurately. So we're just doing an ad hoc kind of clinical trial to see if uh, just palpation is good enough or not. And as part of that, we've brought in an ultrasound machine and we're you know, doing it uh, just as a, as a test. But it's a well accepted uh, tool. I mean, the Japanese have been using it for 25 years now, as right. have the Italians. So it's a, it's a good tool if you have access to it and you can use it. It's, Michal, how do you see in the near future the application of all this technology for the early detection uh, of oral cancer in ambulatory basis? How do yeah, you see? I mean, that, that, that's what excites me the most, more than uh, surgical margins, because that's where I think we'll make the biggest impact uh, on, a, on a wide kind of public health uh, basis. So you know Moni uh, in India, Moni Kuriakos. Yes, Moni Kuriakos. And in collaboration with him and several other folks, uh, uh, what I see happening is, uh, you know, trained volunteers, not doctors, but trained volunteers going out into the villages um, in India, in Brazil, in Argentina, wherever you have a low resource setting, but mm -hmm. people don't come to you know doctors yeah. that frequently, but also here in you know for instance in New York City, uh, there are many underprivileged uh, sections. You could anticipate dental offices using this kind of technology, uh, where you have a swish and spit uh, reagent. And again, I didn't have time to to show you guys that. And Marcelo, you may have seen this, but we've developed a filter that goes onto an iPhone. Yeah. So basically it's a round filter that, that you attach to an iPhone and you shine that, you know, just white light and, you know, collect images. So basically you snap images and send it to the, to the central registry where a pathologist or a clinician can read them. And you say, okay, this looks like uh, it might be cancer. This needs a biopsy that is okay. So you triage people in the field and uh, you know, bring them to care sooner at a low cost. Because the, the lasers that I showed you, you know, the machine that I showed you, the cart, I can't expect it to you know, be affordable in many situations outside of uh, certain economies. But we, we are definitely, there's, there's a whole separate effort on early detection, not just for oral cancer, but uh, cervix, we are very far along with cervix mm -hmm. uh, and also for esophagus. I, thank you very much. Manuel, I think there's another one regarding oropharynx cancer, no? Yeah, uh, concerning oropharynx cancer, when do you consider uh, is, if there is any difference between HPV positive or HPV negative uh, patients? As regards margins, it's concerned. Oh, huh? Yeah, who, regarding who? margins. Oh, regarding margins. Okay, I, I was laughing because uh, we 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 just put out a paper saying that uh, there's no difference in exp uh, expression of PARP one between HPV positive and HPV oh. negative. I thought that was the question, but mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, so uh, we we are thinking about HPV positive versus negative, mm -hmm. uh, and the question was, what is the difference in margins? Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, basically, I, I, I mean, I, I have a very 
unconventional kind of view about margins because I think we have been on the wrong track for many years in interpreting margins. So for instance, HPV negative cancers are generally tobacco and alcohol or and or alcohol induced, right? And the theory is that if you have a positive margin for a conventional HPV negative cancer, uh, that cancer probably arose in a field defect because you know there's there's field change in the rest of the oropharynx or the upper aerodigestive tract, and that patient is at higher risk of recurrence or a second primary or subsequent primary. And that's a fair assumption, and those cancers don't behave as well as the HPV negative cancers, where it's a genetically less complex uh, tumor, the HPV positive tumor. So the conventional paradigm is that if you have a close margin on an HPV positive cancer, it's not as bad as you know, uh, an HPV negative cancer. But I I'm not sure that's entirely true because if you look at HPV positive patient populations, there is not an insignificant amount of distant metastases in these patients. So we don't really know what's going on with a lot of these patients. And as, as time goes, we'll learn more. But I personally don't treat patients differently based on HPV status. If you're going to do an operation, you do it well, or you don't do it. So I don't change the margins based on uh, HPV status, if that's the question. Okay. A last question, Pedro. There is a question of uh, Dr. Mercedes Ortiz regarding the post-operative uh, follow-up. And uh, if there is, if you see that this technology could be also useful in the follow-up on a regular basis, or is mostly an intraoperative uh, approach? No, absolutely not. I mean, just, just as I mentioned, so, you know, th this particular talk was focused on just margins. But the reason the technology excites me is basically for early detection. And the same principle could be used for follow-up. So if you have a person with an oral cancer and you know, you're worried about subsequent primaries or recurrence on the mucosa, absolutely. You could, you could say that, okay, every time the patient comes in or maybe they don't even have to come in. You just have them switch spit, shine a light in the dental office and uh, you know, you come and see the specialist if there is a suspicion. Fantastic. I mean, uh, that's the ideal. I don't think it'll ever happen. There's always going to be the need for a specialist uh, head neck uh, surgical oncologist. Yeah. But basically, these are all adjuncts and, uh, and how you use them is up to you. So it definitely, yes, for surveillance, you definitely use it. I think Dr. Sacco had a question, yes. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Shinehal, um, sometimes uh, we have problems when the pathologist informs us uh, carcinoma in situ in the cut edge of the tumor. Yeah. So uh, this technology uh, could uh, help in this situation. And the second question is, uh, what do you think about uh, about um, uh, carcinoma in situ in in the margin? Is it should should it be considered a positive margin? Yeah, so, you know, both great questions. And, and in the interest of time, I took out that segment from the talk. But that's a very, very important question. Uh, if you go back in history, uh, in the, I think in the mid 90s, there was a survey from the AHNS, the American Head Neck Society. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Wax was the senior author on it. Uh, he sent out a survey to the membership of the American Head Neck Society do you consider CIS at the margin as a positive margin? And believe it or not, there was a whole spectrum of responses. There was no consensus, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, so it's not clear. And the way I interpret it is it depends on the context. So again, if it's a tobacco-induced cancer, CIS at the margin, to me, has little significance, right? Because yes. I can cut anywhere and you'll have dysplasia or, yes. you know, grades of dysplasia or CIS. Now, if you want a negative margin, you can remove the whole oral cavity. 
No. Uh, and you'll probably still have a positive margin or a CIS. So to me, it, it's a context-based uh, decision. Uh, I don't go crazy uh, treating CIS at the margin if uh, you know the person is a smoker drinker and they're expected to have more lesions. The implication of that is you want to survey them more closely. So you want to follow them more closely. You want to be vigilant when they come for follow-up. And the first question that you asked, uh, I don't think uh, this technology will be helpful to differentiate CIS versus uh, invasive cancer. And the reason I say that is the definition of CIS is based on the basement membrane. Okay. Right? So it's a histopathologic definition. And I don't think you can see the basement membrane with any of these uh, adjuncts. So I, I don't think we will have an answer with uh, this kind of technology. Okay, thank you very much. There is another, another question, Pedro, from Dr. Uh, Jansson also. If you okay. consider that uh, PAP1 will have a place in the Sentinel leaf node uh, detection. Yes, so that, that's another part. If you, if, if you were paying attention to my slides, there was a third portion that I grayed out on mapping central nodes. And that project, uh, I did not have, obviously it's not related to margin, so I didn't really explain it. But we've been using nanoparticles uh, to image uh, central nodes in melanoma. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a separate project, but as part of the PARPI-FL uh, experiments in mice, we, when you inject the, the PARPI-FL intravenously, we've noticed that the fluorescence appears in neck nodes as well. So, you know, it, it, it's an interesting observation. If that translates into human beings, the whole concept of central node biopsy will go by the wayside because then you're imaging the neck with a PARP PET agent, you know, uh, do a scan. And if there's no activity in the neck, you follow the patient. Don't do a neck dissection electively. Uh, and, and that's, you know, a possibility. The other possibility is that as you're doing the uh, IV injection to assess margins, uh, you can do a limited neck dissection and pick out lymph nodes that are fluorescent in the neck, just as you would do with a conventional central node biopsy. So yes, uh, it, it does have some promise. We haven't explored it just yet. Thank you, Snehal. Pedro, if you allow me, I have two messages of gratitude to Snehal and one announce. May I? Okay. Yes, of the, course. The first, one, the first one is because of generosity. The, your generosity sharing with us this uh, fantastic lecture. This was, uh, and I see the comments of the, of the people attending the conference that really, it was great. Thank you. Well, and it's my pleasure. The, <laughs> the second one is I would like to thank you again for your tremendous support during uh, our uh, IFNOS conference in 2018 in Buenos Aires, because it was a big deal, a big uh, challenge for the Argentinian society. And you were the main support for this conference. You were really the godfather of the, of the conference uh, in terms of scientific approach and direction. I, I, I would like to thank you again for that. Well, I, I mean, it, let me respond to that one because that was an absolute pleasure. I mean, I've never been involved with a better conference. So you guys did a fantastic job locally and, and it was easily the best conference that I've been involved with. So thank you. great, great work. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. And the last is an announce because uh, as you know, in uh, July 27 uh, is the oral cancer day that have been uh, um, decided by the IFNOS in the, during the Congress in New York in yeah. 2014. And we have decided with Moni Curiacosi to perform on July 27th a webinar associated uh, between the AO Foundation, the IFNOS, Mm -hmm. and the International Academy of Oral Oncology, and you, Snehal, Dr. Reiner, and Dr. Moni Kurekosi will be involved. So it will be transmitted to the whole world and will be uh, uh, supported by the three institutions. Excellent. Huh? Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you again. Pedro. All right. Well, once well, again, uh, Snehal, um, I want to thank you for the wonderful conference you give to us. 
I'm sure we have learned uh, very much about this uh, difficult, difficult issue. So thank you very much again, and we, we hope to see you next. I, I look forward to it. So thank you again for the invitation, and uh, I congratulate you on your, on your organization and uh, the association. So great work. Okay. Thank you very Be much. Be safe. Thank you. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. Esperamos el próximo miércoles. Ok, señores académicos, damos entonces por finalizada la sesión de hoy. Los eh, esperamos el próximo miércoles. Buenas noches.